Question one. Now, I was talking about the reference sheet before. If there's one question where the reference sheet would be useful, this would be it. However, I've pointed out as much as you can, you should not rely on the reference sheet. And something like this, it's not that complicated. What do you think? Does it look alright? You can see I've included this line. It wasn't really necessary in this case. I think most people I think most people could sort of work that out. However, sometimes you'll get something which is significantly messier. For instance, if you get something like, oh, I don't know, um, here's an example, 64A26 plus... Uh, okay, so when you look at that, okay? Actually, no, let me, let me change that, change that to a 9. So, when you look at a question like this, you're like, oh, wait, what am, I, what am I cubing again? I know I've got sums of cubes, okay? So, writing this, writing the next line, like, what is cubed to get 64? It's, it's 4, right? What's cubed to get a, C, a to the power of 6? A squared, right? So that thing is cubed, so now you know what's being cubed. And there's another curveball in here, which is that you look at 9 and you're like, oh yeah, 3, right? Except, no, not 3, because 9 is not a cubic number, right? So you're like, ah, oh, jerks, okay? So what you would have to do is, there's a couple ways you could do this. You could say the cube root of 9, you could, you could just write that. You could simplify it a little further if you like, but you're still going to have some weirdo indices in there, B, and that gets cubed, okay? So you can see, when you get a messier question like this, like, I can ask a question like this, and I'd put it at the start of the paper. I can ask a question like this, and I would put it at the end of the paper. It's the same skill, but it's dependent on whether I want to give you an easy one or a hard one. When it's harder, clearly there is a benefit to writing this intermediate line. Do you see that? So that's why I put it in, even though this one is pretty trivial. So x minus 3, x squared plus 3, x plus 9. Give it a tick, or don't give it a tick. If the person in front of you has got something else, please write in the correct solution for them. Let's have a look at number two. <laughs> okay, now, I've modeled for you here the way that I approach all of these inequality questions, which is to draw a picture. Now you can see it's over here on the left-hand side. It doesn't have to be big or beautiful or neat. I'm just lucky that my iPad just draws straight lines for me. But if yours is, you know, not super accurate, it's okay. You just need enough to be able to say, oh, I want when the absolute value of x minus 3 is less than or equal to 1. That's all you need to say, oh, I, I'm underneath. I'm between these two boundaries. And then you just have to find those boundaries. Okay? So because it's a nice straight, it's a linear function, it's quite easy to read off 2 and 4 as your boundaries. So this is the solution. There's one thing. And then secondly, here is the graph of the solution. So this will be two marks. You get one mark for the inequality for stating it. You get a second mark for the drawing. This is a semicircle. Now, the way to recognize that it's a semicircle is, for starters, just look at the equation first. Do you notice, even though it's not stated, there is actually a restriction on what y can be. y can't be anything, right? I've got the square root here on the right hand side, right? Which I think Eric asked the question a week or two ago. And what's this mean? The square root of something is defined as positive. Do you agree with that? Okay, the square root of 25 is not plus or minus 5. It's just fine. Okay? So therefore, you have this range restriction. In fact, it's helpful to write it up the top there, even if you don't necessarily have to, because then when you go to the next line, you're like, what, what am I going to do with that? I'll square everything. If you square the left and right hand sides, that is still true, except this second line here, you have lost information. The second line doesn't tell you that y has to be positive. Just on this line here, y can be negative. You can put negative numbers in there, and it's fine. You get the bottom half of the semicircle. Then when you look at this, you say, okay, well, the next line, I guess, sorry, let's move this out of the way. The next line would be, you'd add x squared to both sides, and you're like, oh yeah, I recognize that. It has a center at the origin, and it has a radius of five, okay? But then you come back to the first line, you say it's not a circle. It's not a circle, it's only the top half. Does that make sense? So you should have a, um, a nice neat line through there. Uh, they would pay attention to your shape there. This is not a parabola. Therefore, you actually do get, if you were to draw a line right up against the sides of the circle and the top, 
it should be vertical and horizontal respectively. So that gradient is important. You can't hit the axes like this. Right? See, see that there? That's a dead giveaway that you don't really know what the shape is because you haven't drawn it as a semicircle. That's not a semicircle. Okay? So you've got the shape there. You should have intercepts. There are three of them and they're very easy to find. Uh, one last little bit. It's not so important. You certainly wouldn't lose marks, but you should do it. This graph has endpoints. Like, it actually stops. It doesn't keep on going forever. So it's kind of nice and handy to actually put some markers on the end there. And they're filled circles. Why are they filled circles and not, say, for instance, hollow circles? Yeah. Very good. As you look back at the previous question, a filled circle means two is included and four is included. If I had uh, hollow circles like this, I would mean the region or that line, but not two and not four. Okay? In exactly the same way, when you come and look at the semicircle, this means that part's included. Sometimes it won't be. We'll look at those examples later on, but in this case it is. Okay. Right, let's have a look down here. Uh, you might have looked at it and thought, oh gross, let's start pairing. But it's just collecting like terms. Okay? That's all it is. There are x squareds, I've highlighted them. There are xy's, that's all there is to it. Here's my solution to the algebraic equation. Can I get some nods of agreement? Or some shapes of, yeah, okay, good, excellent, right? You can see the way that I've done it is I've multiplied through by x plus three, x minus five. <coughs> You're 11. Once I've multiplied through, I've then expanded. Now, can I just um, point out for you I know when I see something like this, my instinct is, as I've been trained, to go this times that times that, and then go this times that times that. And that's fine, we'll give you the right answer, okay? But look at this. This is a factorized quadratic. We spend lots and lots of time turning these into these. How do we do it? What pair, how do we work out what these pairs of numbers are? We think, yeah. The minus two and the minus five, they add to get like minus seven. And yeah, very good. Fantastic. So you're thinking of a pair of numbers that adds to negative 7, multiplies to positive 10, and that's how you get those numbers. So therefore, all you have to do, you don't have to like work out and collect like terms and that kind of thing. You just look at these and say, well, they add to negative 7, and they multiply to 10, and the same thing over there. Okay? It's just a little thing. You're very good at this, so just use that skill you already have. I've collected like terms, and then I've divided through that's it. The most common error on this question is negative 7. Negative 7? Because we're so used to dividing big numbers by small numbers and not recognizing, well, there's nothing wrong with dividing a small number by a big number. It's just, in real life, we don't have that as much. Okay, here's number 6. Now, uh, you can see, again, I've had to factorize that quadratic. I've factorized the denominator as well. And then you get this thing. Uh, it cancels, which is convenient, which is one of the ways you're like, oh yeah, cool, I'm on the right track. Now I just want to point out one extra thing that I doubt anyone has. If they do, super thumbs up, I'm impressed. How many of you did anyone write that? Anyone? Okay, I'm not surprised, and you wouldn't lose a mark for it in this context. However, I'm going to ask all of you right now to write it onto your friend's paper. Because, two reasons. Number one, it's true. <laughs> M can't equal one, and I know that from this factorized line. In here, uh, m can't equal 1. There's another thing it can't equal to, by the way. What is that? It can't be equal to 0 either. Okay? Now, I want you to think about why. It's all about this denominator. Okay? Now, why did I bother saying this at the end? To go from the second line to the third line, these are algebraically equivalent. Okay? If I put a number, like say m equals 5, if I put it into here and then evaluate it, I'd get the same thing exactly as if I put it into here and then evaluate it. So algebraically, they are equivalent. However, this line has, is, there's some information missing from this line that is present in this line. Namely, when you see that m minus 1 on the denominator, you know m can't equal 1. Right? But once you cancel it out, that information disappears. It's a little bit like when I said this. Um, if you take the square root of a square number, right? uh, you're going to get something at the other end. You might think, oh, it's a. Right? Because square root, squaring, they're opposite. But it's not a. Do you remember what the definition is? That's the absolute value of a, right? 
So going from this line, sorry, this expression to this expression, uh, they're algebraically the same, right? You put a number in the left-hand side, you'll get the same thing on the right-hand side. But the right-hand side strips away some information. You don't know whether A was positive or not. Does that make sense? And it's the same thing with this line. Those restrictions don't matter really at the moment, because who cares what M is? I don't, it doesn't matter, I'm just simplifying. But later on, it really does matter. So that's why I think this is a helpful thing to get in the habit of. Right, we're almost at the end. Uh, in fact, we can pretty much uh, do these two together. The factorization is pretty straightforward. Group, common factors, you get difference in squares and out pops your factorization at the end. When you simplify down here, you had to remember how to work with these thirds. We haven't looked at that recently. I'll address that uh, later this lesson. We'll talk about it recently. Um, then you have to collect some like terms. Does it look all right? Yeah, some odds. fantastic. And here's the last question. Again, you have to multiply through. This time there were no shortcuts. And then you collect like terms at the end.